Okay, so in this video, we are going to encounter a transmission line that ends in a short circuit with AC voltages on it. And we're going to see what happens. And this is where things are going to start to get wacky. Um, and let's see, prepare your mind to be blown. This is the this is the beginning of what we're going to see. So um, let's uh, take a deep dive into what happens with the transmission line that ends in a short circuit. All right, so here we go. I'm going to draw a transmission line. I'll draw a short circuit. All right, I'm going to remind you that there is an input voltage here, V in, which has a phasor form, and there's an output voltage, V out. C0 is the intrinsic, trans, uh, tr intrinsic impedance of this transmission line. Uh, D will be the length of the transmission line. And let's just start out for now. I'm gonna start out as an exercise with D being one quarter of a wavelength, right? It's exactly a quarter of a wavelength long. Again, we've all agreed on the frequency. We know what it is. We've, we're designing a system to operate in one frequency or one narrow range of frequencies. So I, we know what the wavelength is. And, and let's say this transmission line is a quarter wavelength here. All right. And this is gonna be the Z equals zero point right here, and the axis is going to be defined that way. Uh, so basically, the uh, input here is at z equals zero, and the load is at z equals a positive a quarter wavelength. All right? We want to define the input impedance. And z in, the definition, is v in plus v out divided by i in plus I out, right? In this case, though, what's different is that we actually can figure out what the output voltage is as a function of the input voltage. So let's walk ourselves through the steps of what's going to happen. And I'm gonna draw a complex plane so we can track what's happening to the phaser, um, beginning with the input and working right to the output. All right, let's say that Vn is just a cosine function with phase zero and amplitude one. The phase value of that would be one, right? So that is a cosine of omega t plus zero, right? Let me just get rid of the zero here, right? That would correspond to a phase value of one. All right, I'm gonna draw that in. And let's do it in blue. Uh, I'm going to draw that in here, and we're going to label this as V in. Okay, now, remember, as the voltage propagates from the injection point to the load, it's going to change its phase. In other words, uh, V as a function of Z will be equal to the value of the voltage at the input, or at Z equals zero, times this phase factor, E to the minus J beta Z, right? The beta again is the uh, radians per meter. It's how much the phase changes when you walk forward, for, forward and by one meter. And Z is the distance. In this case, uh, we're gonna replace Z with the length of the transmission line or D, all right? Uh, D in this case is lambda over four. So I'm gonna rewrite this as V in squiggle times E, and let's examine this for a second. Uh, beta equals two pi divided by lambda, and D equals lambda over four. So you multiply that together and the lambdas cancel and you end up with e to the minus j times pi over two, all right? All this means is that as the phaser goes from the input to the load, it has rotated in the negative direction or the clockwise direction by 90 degrees. And so let's draw that in right here, all right? This is the phaser value of the voltage at the load. All right. In particular, it's right before it reaches the load. Now, we also know that once it reaches the load, there's going to be a reflection. 
that reflection coefficient equals negative one. And so if this second blue line here represents the phaser just as it's hitting the load, right after that reflection, we've got to flip it by minus one, which means we're going to draw like this. This is a, a minus one flip. This is the value of the voltage right after the load. All right now, let's keep that going. That same uh, voltage is now propagating in the, in the negative direction, which means that V squiggle as a function of Z equals V as a phaser after the load times E to the positive J beta D. In this case, it's positive because the wave is now moving to the left, right? It's moving in, in the negative direction. All right, in this case, E to the plus J beta D, again, turns out to be E to the positive J pi over two. Uh, that means that the phase is going to rotate, or the phaser is going to rotate by 90 degrees in the positive direction. So this is gonna rotate over here and it's gonna end up here, All right? So this is going to be V at the output, All right? So we started out with a VN that has a phaser value of one. It rotated 90 degrees uh, in the counter, in the uh, clockwise direction, and then it multiplied by negative one, and then it rotated another nine degrees in the positive direction. Now, those are the voltages, All right? Let's repeat the same with current. I'll do this a little bit quicker. And so the current, let's keep this in red, uh, the current is gonna have value Vn divided by Z0. And again, it'll be in phase. So uh, it'll uh, um, have a, a, a phaser that's along the x-axis, right? And the same thing is gonna happen as that current rotates to the load, right? It's going to move along 90 degrees. Uh, so this is V at the load. Divided by Z0. All right, now the difference is that when it encounters the load, the reflection coefficient for current is positive one because it's the opposite of what it is for voltage. So the voltage after the load is going to be the same as it was right before the load. This is V after load divided by Z0. All right. So now we've got to propagate it again. And as the wave goes from the load back to the source, it's again gonna rotate by 90 degrees in the clockwise direction, and it's gonna end up here, right? So this is uh, V out, sorry, this is I out, pointed in this direction which has magnitude V in divided by Z zero, it's just pointed in the opposite direction, all right? Now with this, we are now equipped to calculate the input impedance of this circuit that has a quarter wave transmission line that ends in an open circuit. And for that, let's just visually look at the phasers. V in plus V out uh, is just going to, they're gonna add up perfectly because V in and V out have the same value. They both have a phaser value of one. So this is going to be one plus one, all right? Now we're gonna divide that by I in plus I out, right? The sum of the input current and the output current. And you can take a look and you can see that I in and I out are equal and opposite of each other. The first one has a phasor value of positive one and the other has a phasor value of negative one, all right? So the input impedance equals one plus one over one minus one, or if you prefer, two divided by zero, and this is infinite, All right? Now let's stop to think about that for a second, because we started out with a load that's an open, that's a short circuit, and we then step a quarter of a wavelength away from that transmission line, and what we're calculating is that the input impedance is infinity, or it's an open circuit. So if you are standing at this point right there, and you're injecting a voltage, 
and you're watching how the current responds to it. You would be fooled into thinking that you're attaching your voltmeter to an infinite uh, resistance. You have absolutely no idea that it's actually a cord wave transmission line that ends in a short circuit. Now, this is completely wacky if you think about it. We're basically taking a short circuit and making it appear to be an open circuit, right? So there's one of those like, you know, get ready to blow your mind. Um, here we go. A short circuit has become an open circuit simply by setting the length of the transmission line to a quarter wavelength and then calculating what happens to a sinusoidal wave that goes in, um, considering it as a wave, All right? Now, you can probably take a similar approach, except have the wavelength be something else, right? So if you repeat the process, with d equals lambda over two, it's now a half a wavelength. Um, I'll pretty quickly show you how that's going to land. Just a second. Uh, this will be our Vn. The half wavelength propagation to the load is basically going to rotate this phaser by 180 degrees, right? And this will be the V before the load. All right now, again, we're reflecting off of a short circuit, which has a reflection coefficient of negative one. So this is our V after the load. And now we got to rotate it by another 180 degrees as we uh, basically change the phase for the propagation from the load back out to the source. So this will again rotate over here, and this will be V out. All right, repeat the same thing for current. And I'll just uh, skip this and tell you that this is I in and I out turns to be here, turns out to be here. All right, so now we can take the phasor sum of this, right? Z in is the sum of the voltages divided by the sum of the currents. So V in plus V out are equal and opposite. So they're gonna cancel. This is one minus one, right? The sum of the currents are, are something different, right? This is one over Z zero plus one over Z zero. So this works out to be an input impedance of zero ohms, right? So when we increase the length to a half a wavelength, we are back to it being a short circuit, right? The load was a short circuit and the transmission line appears to be a short circuit, right? Now you can repeat this process over and over again with different lengths, with an arbitrary value of the, of the length. Um, and there's a specific example in the notes of what happens if D equals 0 0.1 lambda. And what you'll find is that Z in turns out to be uh, either an inductor or a capacitor if D is a, a different value that's not a quarter or a half wavelength. Uh, so if you solve this, you're going to get the following, that for a shorted transmission line, the input impedance equals J times Z zero times the tangent of beta times the length of a transmission line D, right? So let's examine this for a second. Um, and let's, let's actually plot this. And so this is the imaginary part of the input impedance, right? Now, first thing I wanna point out is that the input impedance is strictly an imaginary number. Z zero is a real number, tangent of beta D is a real number. And so we're multiplying a real number by J, it's a purely imaginary number. So the input impedance of a transmission line that has a short circuit at the end will look like either an inductor or a capacitor or a short circuit or an open circuit, it will never look like a resistor. 
All right, so that's point number one. Let's draw what this looks like and just plot a uh, tangent of beta D. It's gonna look like this. It's gonna start out at D equals zero. It's gonna start out with the value of zero. And then it's gonna have a big asymptote right there. All right, and then it's gonna pick up from negative infinity, work its way over here cross and then go to positive infinity again and this will repeat all right this value right here is where d equals lambda and that different color this value over here is where d equals lambda over four the quarter wavelength point all right this value over here is the half wavelength point all right um, right there, uh, at the half wavelength point, you see we've sort of gone through a whole cycle uh, and sort of returned where we started. We have a short circuit on the load, and we have a short circuit if the transmission line is exactly a half a wavelength long. Everywhere else, we have either an inductor, right? So this whole section right here is an inductor, and this whole section where the uh, input impedance is less than zero, is a capacitor, All right? So if we have a very short transmission line that terminates with a short circuit, that is equivalent to having an inductor. And the longer we make that line, the inductance increases, 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 increases until it reaches positive infinity, an infinite inductance, right? Or an infinite inductive impedance, All right? Now we go to the flip side, and it reappears at negative infinity. When we go to the quarter wavelength point and go just a little bit past it, we have a negative, a very high negative value of the, the capacitive impedance, which means that Zn equals a negative big number, right? If we equate that to minus J over omega C, that means it has a small capacitance. A small capacitance means a big impedance, All right? So this would be a small capacitor This would be a large capacitor, would be over here, all right? And then as we increase the line and make it longer, uh, the capacitive impedance is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it approaches the halfway point. And then as the line gets longer, the process repeats, all right? Now, why does this double back and repeat at the half wavelength point, not at the full wavelength point? This should make some sense if you go back to this perspective that if the line is a quarter wavelength long, the actual propagation distance to go into the load and back out is double that because you got to go in two directions, right? And so when D is a half a wavelength, you have a full wavelength to go in and out. And so that's why when the line is a half wavelength long, that's where you sort of back where you started, you've created a full wavelength of propagation delay. Um, and so this pattern is going to repeat and it's all described by this equation. The input impedance of a shorter transmission line is J times Z0 times the tangent of beta D. If you'd like, you can look at this beta D as the electrical length of the transmission line. It's the length of the transmission line in radians, right? It's the length of the transmission line in radians. Right? And again, make sure that if you're applying this, say, in a calculator with MATLAB, be sure you're keeping the units correctly. Um, beta 2 pi over lambda is a radians per meter. Uh, D is in meters, in which case this output is in radians, beta D. All right. So what we're seeing here is there's sort of a circular repeating pattern that we can uh, look at. And it kind of goes like this. Uh, on this side, we're going to have short circuit. On this side, we're going to have open circuit. And we're basically going to loop around this circle as we increase the length of the transmission line. All right, so D equals zero will be located right here. And as we increase D, we're basically going to walk around this circle 
in the clockwise direction and one spin of the circle is equivalent to uh, D increasing by lambda over two or by a half a wavelength. All right. So you can see the dynamics that if we have a short circuited transmission line, that really enables us, if we set the length properly, to take on any inductor or any capacitive value that we can, or even to create an open circuit out of it, simply by varying the length of the transmission line. And it all comes from the fact that uh, the input voltage and the output voltage are forced to relate to each other because of that, uh, that wavelength that sort of connects everything together. Uh, it forces two points that are a wavelength apart to have the same voltage. Uh, and, and therefore, um, uh, it forces this relationship to be the case. Uh, now, input impedance is a little bit it's a little bit fishy because um, if I just if you have a wall and there's two probes in the wall and I tell you what's the what's the input impedance right and you you put a voltmeter on it and then you measure the current across that voltmeter right and you're putting in a sinusoidal voltage in particular um, you would have no way to know whether there is simply a res simply an open circuit or whether there is a quarter wave transmission line and a short circuit. However, that's not strictly true because you could change the frequency. If you change the frequency, then a line that was a quarter wavelength long is no longer a quarter wavelength. So this notion of a short circuit becomes an open circuit is really only applicable at a single frequency. If you vary the frequency a little bit, then you're varying the electrical length of the transmission line. Right, this value here, beta D, will change as you vary the frequency because beta will change. All right, so that concludes part two. In the next uh, part, we're going to talk about open circuit transmission lines, which spoiler alert is gonna look fairly similar to this. And we're gonna sort of link those together um, and set up uh, to move beyond that.